Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, September 2021 technical presentation brought to you by uh, IEEE MTT SCV. My name is Sutkashoni Krishna. I'm the chairman of this chapter. And today we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Yako Yuntunen. Uh, who will be speaking about the radiation and total efficiency maximization of electrically small aperture tuned antennas. Uh, before we go on to the talk itself, let's take a quick look at the agenda for today. So we'll be quickly looking at some meeting notes, followed by the COVID-19 update. We'll look at the chapter officers for MTTSCV. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, we will be looking at uh, some details about the IoT short course, which we are organizing next month. Uh, after that, uh, we'll have some information for you about the 2022 officer nomination that's in progress right now. Then we'll go on to details about the talk itself, uh, and then to the talk uh, by Dr. Yun Tunen, uh, which will be mixed with Q&A. So a few things to note, uh, this meeting is being recorded and it's being broadcast live on Zoom. Uh, links to the recorded video and slides will be sent to all registrants. Uh, please keep cameras off and microphones muted uh, to help with bandwidth issues, background noise, and such. Uh, please ask your questions by raising the using the raise hand reaction button in Zoom. Uh, we'll be taking breaks every 15, 20 minutes or so, and uh, uh, we'll be taking your questions uh, periodically. Uh, also, please ensure that your display name in Zoom matches the one you used to register. This will make it easier for us to check you in. Uh, okay, so uh, to talk about COVID-19 pandemic updates and uh, the rest of the stuff, uh, I'd like to call upon our treasurer, Mr. Than Tu. Than? Thank you. Um, so due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, all in-person meeting related to our chapter are canceled. Our monthly technical meetings and officer meeting will continue in, in a webinar format only until further notice. Next page. So this, this, this is the summary of our charter officers. Uh, as, as you heard earlier, um, the chair is um, Mr. Ukkos Bukis Krishna and Mr. Vice Chair is uh, Mr. Tom McKay. Secretary is Mr. Venkata Gadi, and myself is the treasurer on time too. Next page. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Tom McKay, who will go over the uh, sub the um, courses for next month. Thank you, Tan. Um, I'd like to invite you all to our short course scheduled for Saturday, October 9th. Uh, it's a fully virtual event, and it's going to be focused on the Internet of Things challenges of, and opportunities in industrial and infrastructure applications, integration, e efficiency, device reliability, and robust circuit architectures. So our agenda will cover um, looking forward for the next 20 years from the experience of the last 20 um, we will then have a talk from Professor Dave Wensloff at the University of uh, Michigan, who's also co-founder of the company EverActive on low power IoT uh, and power consumption challenges and addressing those. And then we're really pleased to um, have a talk on uh, the ability that, that exists in the, in the industry to predict CMOS reliability, traditionally applied to digital systems, but uh, Fernando Guarin, um, IEEE fellow, EDS past president, um, will be addressing with his colleague, um, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, uh, about how to, you know, how we can predict reliability for these decades long deployments in infrastructure. Um, and then we're really pleased to have Danielle Griffith, um, fellow at Texas Instruments, 
um, and she's going to talk about low power wide area interface standards and their associated architectures. Um, we then also have uh, um, Professor Jeff Walling um, at, of Virginia Tech on talking about direct to digital RF transmitters. Switching architectures is a good choice for IoT. And that, that, that speaks really to robustness. So next slide, please. I just wanted to highlight um, the caliber of speaker scheduled uh, to engage with, with, with our membership and our attendees uh, at the short course. Um, Fernando Guarin is, as I mentioned, um, um, an IEEE fellow and um, was the past president of EDS. He comes with uh, a, a wide, uh, long uh, experience base, um, you know, including defense systems, IBM microelectronics, and now uh, global foundries. Danielle Griffith um, has, uh, has been very active as a um, innovator um, with solid contributions to um, the uh, you know, low power transceivers and other uh, low power oscillators and um, very active with solid state circuits community, RFIC community, and now VLSI. Dr. Wensloff um, is, as I mentioned, is uh, a professor at the University of uh, Michigan and also is co-founder at EverActive um, and uh, is, is also uh, widely published and is also awarded um, many times with regard to his teaching style. So we're really pleased to get his participation. And then uh, Dr. Walling um, uh, is also um, a very well-established uh, innovator in our field, bringing in a mixed signal kind of concept into the microwave world. So um, I look forward to your participation. Uh, I think there'll be um, invitations or you know, uh, sent out um, uh, in the coming days. Thank you. The nomination period for the 2022 officers um, is, is open um, to the end of, of September. If you are an MTTS member in good standing from the Bay Area and wish to serve as an officer, please send uh, an email with the information below, the name, position of interest, um, membership numbers, phone number and email address to Mr. Jay Banway. And you know, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Next slide. So did IEEE uh, and its members inspire a global community to highly cited publications, conferences, technology standards, and professional and educational activities. The MTT Society focuses on a theory and application of radio frequency, guided wave, and wireless technologies. So please support us by becoming a member. Uh, you can join the IEEE with this link below, and then also draw, please join the MTTS at, at this following link. Please also follow us on LinkedIn. LinkedIn at this uh, this link. Next slide. So the, the talk today, the title is Radiation and Total Efficiency Maximization of Electrically Small Aperture Tune Antennas. And our speaker is Dr. Jaco Trinitan. He's a sales director of Optimi LTD. And he has worked over 20 years in RF microwave EDA industry. He is an industry veteran with experience in, the, in field application engineering and sales roles. He has been with Optimi since 2014. He has strong background in computational electromagnetic and especially in combining circuit and EM simulations. The talk today will be as follows. One main challenge design of pan antenna must overcome 
is achieving good quality performance at low frequency bands. The hurdles are small antennas have poor radio efficiencies. At low frequencies, antennas have high Q values, and three, the matching bandwidth is narrow. To reduce the impact of these obstacles, the designers resort to aperture tuning. It is a technique utilized to adjust antennas' radiation properties by connecting radiator currents to ground to switch reactive components. In effect, aperture tuning influences both the radiation efficiency and available bandwidth. A successful design yields an optimized fixed matching circuits and switch aperture components that enhance the total performance. In this presentation, we will demonstrate how the optimization process problem can be solved. Next slide. With that, with no further ado, go ahead and uh, transition to the presenter slides. Thank you. <clears throat> so, it's Jaco here. I, I will start the presentation. Um, okay, I hope you can see it. Is it okay? Uh, yes. Okay, so you can see it. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Stan, for the, the introduction. So, indeed, today we will talk about small antenna problem. And um, what actually is the problem problem that we are trying to solve? So why what what why are we having uh, problems? What what does a um, small antenna mean actually? Uh, it's particularly a notorious problem with handsets, and so that's just basically very simple physical issue. The handsets are just too small and uh, compared with the some of the wavelengths that they are supposed to, to support. And in particular, nowadays, uh, there are more of those low frequency bands that have become available, say below 600 megahertz. There are some bands are located at 450 megahertz, for example. For example, here in Scandinavia, there was like a, a mobile telephone network that was operating at 450 megahertz, and that now it's like a outdated system, so these frequencies have become available. But unfortunately, the handsets have not become any bigger, rather than maybe the converse. And so to just as a demonstration or example of the, the issue that we have, say what is how, how the short antennas actually work. So we have a like a approximate formula for, for a short dipole and its radiation resistance. And for example, at 700 megahertz, we may assume to have just a, a few ohm radiation resistance. And the radio systems, though, are <clears throat> typically 50 ohms. So we have an issue here. And um, it's not so much dependent upon what particular type of antenna is used, like PIFA or monopole type antenna, or such that is like a, uh, being used in, in handsets. It's always the case that the reactive part of the small antenna is always much higher. And so this, this is just a, a rephrasing the fact that the Q value of the antenna ten, tends to be very high. So what are the issues that relate to why is it so problematic? So there are two things. So almost by the definition of the Q value, it means that the, the matching bandwidth is narrow. And there is another related problem, which is that the mat practical matching circuits will necessarily be lossy. And because we make the, the small antennas resonant by discrete components, basically, inductors and capacitors. And in order to be have high efficiency, then the, the components Q value should be at least in par with the Q value of the antenna itself. Otherwise, 
the, the resonances that are created by LNC, the losses will, will dominate. And this is like a very pronounced problem for its own right. And another problem, all of them relate together, but there is the, the issue of radiation efficiency, which is also coming from basically from the fundamental laws of physics, which is not so much technology dependent issue. So the, the radiation efficiency would benefit in having high volumes for the, the antennas allocated. But in practice, the situation is quite the converse. So the handset size is about the same. There are lots of radio systems and lots of antennas in the handsets. And the industrial design of the handset tends to determine the available volume. And so this is this is like the corner in which the antenna designer has to live. And so whatever magic and tricks we may make with the matching circuits, we can fix the potentially the impedance issue and make it match to the radiation resistance of the antenna. But nonetheless, we can't change the low radiation efficiency. And so a typical, like a notorious <coughs> bad combo for small antennas. We have a combination of narrow band with high component losses, low radiation efficiency. And at the same time, we have a conflicting goal supporting wide bandwidth, uh, preferably with as low losses as possible. So the question arises, how are we then solving this problem? Uh, a common technique is the, the topic of today, the aperture tuning. And in this technique, essentially, part of the radiator current is rerouted and most often to ground. So pictorially like this. And then in the hope of getting benefit from two effects that relate to doing so. So one of the effects is that the matchable bandwidth changes. So by matchable, I mean the, the frequency, the, the, the sub band that we can match in the first place. And the, the second uh, phenomenon taking place is that the radiation efficiency of the antenna or the combination of antenna and the ground plane uh, also changes. Or we can say that or hope that the, the frequency in which we still have an acceptable radiation efficiency will change. And if we are lucky, the combined effect are favorable. And so we have achieved performance improvement by placing this aperture component. And indeed, if we design it carefully, we can actually cover a wide bandwidth. And um, because say, at ev every individual state of the, the antenna and the aperture component, the, the laws of physics tend to cause rather narrow bandwidth, but we can perhaps slice the coverable band in subbands by switching a different appropriately designed aperture component for each of the subbands. So after all, the idea is, is relatively simple. So there are some, some innovations um, or innovative ideas that I want to, to, to present in this context. Something that we in Opteni have been working since the beginning of our company. So we've been there about 12 years now. And one key concept is what we call bandwidth potential of an antenna. And it is a, a great way of measuring the matchability of available bandwidth of an antenna. And as an example, 
if we first consider uh, conjugate matching an antenna so we know that at least theoretically we can always if we if we take lossless um, reactances we can always conjugate match whatever its radiation efficiency or uh, sorry whatever its um, radiation resistance or q value and if we if we do so at certain frequency then the impedance trajectory is famously going exactly through the Smith chart center. And so we get certain bandwidth. So we have the, the, the low low end and then the high end. And about in the middle, we go, go through the Smith chart center. But if we look at this picture, then we would actually be able to obtain a wider bandwidth by deliber deliberately uh, going around the uh, center point. So rather, if we move, the, the trajectory a little bit to the right and up, then we would fit perhaps this loop uh, inside the 10 dB, in this case 10 dB uh, circle, like this. And, and here in this example, for example, our uh, symmetrical bandwidth uh, increases by more than two times. And so this, this requires like a careful design or careful selection of the, the matching circuit that is doing the trick. And this mechanism actually is what we have been doing uh, in, in our software of TaniLab since the beginning. So the, we are stepping through considering each frequency point as the center frequency point and applying this process that was shown um, in the previous slide and and this way we get a like a matchability uh, assessment of the um, uh, antenna which is like a, a lot more informative than just looking at the s parameter of the antenna and for example we are able to identify and reveal sweet spots so to speak of the antenna for example in this case we have uh, obviously a sweet spot at 4.3 gigahertz which might be like in in a way hidden in the s parameter data itself likewise let's call it bitter spot at 3.6 gigahertz which is just saying that almost whatever we do we cannot make the impedance bandwidth wider than 50 megahertz at the range of 3.6 gigahertz, which just means that this is like a hopeless attempt. And if our target band is, is at 3.5, 3.6 gigahertz, if it's wider than, say, for example, 100 or 200 megahertz, it just means that we, we simply can't stop with this antenna. It will not never work. So even though the analysis is based on two component matching, there is like a, a theoretical upper limit for how much bandwidth can be increased by just adding more components. And typically this is a very accurate measure of the available bandwidth with any number of, of components. Of course, if we add components, we add losses and you can do resistive matching but this is uh, not we what we are looking after fundamentally um at this point if there are any questions so far we can consider or we move yeah, um, I, this is tom mckay I, I have a question so um yeah i i i the the point you made that don't go for you know 50 ohms go for bandwidth um, and and that you know so don't target the best return loss at a particular frequency um, <clears throat> yeah that that's I, I've basically my my thought is um, is this something that's being done um, in a like circuit synthesis sense or is there something um involved in electromagnetic aspects 
simultaneously. So uh, that, that, I mean, when you add the component is that a, you know, you're in a sort of circuit network theory synthesis domain, or is there a tie-in to electro electromagnetic properties? Because, you know, when you put in a component like you were showing, you, you're going to disturb the fields on there, the current distribution, and you want to. Um, I'm just, I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you explain? I, yes, I, I got your your point. So this analysis is entirely in the circuit synthesis side, and so we we are considering, say, the, one of the previous slides where we we add the Apache component, which indeed it changes the fields, it changes also the S parameter of the, the feed. But in this plot, and we will come back to this actually late, a bit later, um, but this, this um, analysis that we see, see here is for any frozen state of aperture component. Okay. And we, we apply the matching synthesis at the input, at the feed. And, okay. and so uh, it, it, there is this synthesis aspect indeed, because it's obviously it's a different, like a optimal matching circuit that is maximizing the bandwidth. So behind the scenes, we, we like a generate uh, a, a matching circuit, say an optimal two component matching circuit and, and select the one that is providing the widest bandwidth. But this, this, this so far we, we, we're talking about the, at the feed point, and uh, now when, when, you, when, you, when you raise this, actually the next slide, bandwidth potential as a function of aperture component, this is like a very, very valid point. So when uh, we change the aperture component, then we can evaluate for each uh, aperture component value, this same graph. And in this way, what I have started calling it the map, map of the impedance tunability of the or matchability behavior of the antenna. And so to, to make it a little bit more like a concrete. So here we have a, like a simplistic sketch. What is it about? So we had a have a feed in, in our mock-up model. We have a feed port and we have this aperture port. And say if we then are assuming various say components, for example, one nano Henry inductor or one picofarad capacitor. And then let's say that the situation or, or the impedance behavior uh, varies when we look from, from the feed perspective. And uh, we, we get the, a, a, a set of graphs like this. And this is what I call um, matchability map. So for here we have, uh, say, the bandwidth potential uh, as a function of aperture component. So if, if we have aperture open, we have this uh, blue curve, which seems to be favorable here. So we get the widest bandwidth uh, if we assume an, an, an open aperture. And then we have those, those uh, other component values like uh, uh, shorting the aperture port in the other extreme. And then we have, say, a, a couple of selected, just a, a couple of values, say, realistic values that we might consider for the aperture tuning. And as an other ex extreme, so if we had a five picofarad component, then it provides the poorest bandwidth. So say within the, within the technique, we, we don't get actually, it's so narrow. If we focus on the range from 700 to 1000 megahertz, for example, that this map already tells that the worst idea that you potentially could have is to put a five picofarad capacitor to this uh, aperture port. Whereas from the impedance bandwidth perspective, something which is like uh, close to the open circuit would be maybe a great idea. And so the, the electromagnetic question, um, 
sorry for the packed slide. This is here actually for the reason that if you want to, to look at the details uh, afterwards. So the characterization for uh, say different, um, so or let's put it this way. So whenever we change the, the discrete component at the aperture port, indeed it changes the fields and currents but it does not require a new EM simulation because all the information is contained in the far fields that we, we calculate with like a reference termination of the ports. So we have two ports, we have the input port one and then we have the aperture port number two. And if we pre-characterize say in EM simulation or a measurement, the far fields due to unit excitation and, and the other port being terminated to 50 ohm, then we have actually all the information available to calculate the, the total radiation pattern using essentially circuit simulation techniques. So we can calculate from this matrix equation uh, what are the coefficients w1 and 2 that uh, correspond to any like a particular termination of the the aperture port and and then we just calculate the, the superposition of the, the radi radiation patterns like the let's call it unit radiation patterns and then we have the total radiation pattern and from this total radiation pattern, we can calculate the radiation efficiency. And so here, here we have a, a short animation where I did like a real time tuning the aperture component over certain uh, inductor values. And then we are looking at say the normalized radiation pattern uh, over the aperture component. And then we can see that indeed, say that the total radiation pattern and thus the um, radiation efficiency is a function of this component. But the point being that it's, it's very efficient because it can, it's essentially done in the circuit simulation stage. So the, the electromagnetic characterization or the uh, chamber measurement is done first as a pre-processing and all this work from that point forward is, is post-processing and it's very efficient. So if you use the software, it's, it's literally like, like this. So it's not speeding up here just for the video, but because this is like a essentially quite simple circuit simulation and then superposition of, of, of just um, uh, radiation far field pattern data, it's very quick. And so this gives us, um, a lot of advantage because now we can calculate the radiation efficiency as well as a function of the aperture component and so which means that we get an other map so one of the maps was this uh, bandwidth here on the left and then we have a second map which is then the radiation efficiency versus aperture component And for this mock-up design here, we have a have a, like an example. And for example, so <clears throat> if we look the, the the map on the left, then our co conclusion was that open circuit would be great. But if we look at the radiation efficiency, then unfortunately this blue curve has rather poor radiation efficiency at low frequencies. And so this is, this is a, a common situation that we can say, draw the conclusions very easily only by looking at these graphs. And so most likely the, the good compromise, if we look at say the, the, the optimal radiation efficiency, they are obtained if we have a, a few nano Henry uh, component in this case while the the bandwidth potential map is 
saying that it's it's not the highest bandwidth available and but it's directly saying then that we need to slice so we get some bandwidth and if we chop the the, the, the total band into subbands then we should be okay because the radiation efficiency is, is acceptable or it is anyway about as good as it ever gets and so th this is like one of the the uh, let's let's put it innovations that we have here that in at least in my my and our opinion this is quite a concise way of of looking at this uh, basically very complicated optimization problem uh, as an assessment of the the status of of our small antenna um are there any any questions at this point uh yes uh hassan yes mr hassan hi uh, so uh, i have two quick questions the first one maybe i missed this one so how so you said the the small antennas can have a like a small radiation resistance like to ohm for example you, you showed an yeah. example for dipole right so and then you said you're gonna for each antenna that you're presenting here you're gonna conjugate match and calculate the, the absolute bandwidth so when you conjugate match actually you are removing the, the imaginary part of the input impedance and but you are left out with a small radiation resistance like i mean like how to, do you calculate this absolute bandwidth for or do you look at the s11 or um this assessment so, so actually um maybe you missed say some part of the, the 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 bandwidth thing so the one of the points was that say the conjugate match is not the right mm -hmm. thing usually because okay. we can get we can get uh, by uh, let's say intentionally uh, mismatching a little bit mm -hmm. uh, we can get like a compromised uh, return loss that is has more bandwidth so so getting say the the resonance loop circling around the okay. Smith yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand yes that. okay so and so and and so the the assessment uh, regarding the say the bandwidth it's so we, we indeed we set set say the say when we have absolute bandwidth here this indeed it relates to um to the assumption that we are doing the matching using lossless uh, reactive components and we are looking at the uh, say the return loss bandwidth okay. for certain level so in this graph if i remember well i maybe set the the target to 10 db quite quite common is to set to 6 db and and the values would be different understood yes. so uh, this gets me to to the next question i have regarding the simulations you showed uh, you had for a antenna internally load with a lumped component like for example you you mentioned op open to short and back yes. senses capacitances everything so one way to simulate this problem is to do a full wave EM simulation, a two port EM simulation. Yes. One, one port is the feed and the other port is the port at which you put the lump component. Yes. And then bring the, the S parameters that you have calculated to a circuit simulator and add the lump components. My understanding is that this technique wouldn't work for, for this particular problem. You have to actually individually simulate each uh, loaded antenna separately, right? Is, is that a correct statement? Um, so the, the thing is that it's not only, it's, it's very, very hard of actually of the technique is that uh, S parameters is not enough. <laughs> So we need to process also the far field patterns. Right. So we, we take the, it's I think I called, let me, if I can scroll back a little bit uh, here. Um, so we, we, we take, so we use say regular uh, 
techniques, regular circuit simulation techniques uh, to calculate, say, the so for whatever termination we have for the aperture port, we, we calculate the, the port voltages essentially with circuit simulation. So we, we have a feed, we have voltage one, <clears throat> and then we have some aperture component, an inductor or capacitor, and then we, we have port voltages calculated using circuit simulator. Let's call them E1 and E2. And then we can calculate the, let's say the, the weight factors that are required to uh, like a, th these weights apply to the radiation patterns. Um, so when we have say that the port one excited and the aperture port terminated to 50 ohm, then we, we have let's say, let's say certain kind of reference uh, voltages and, and the related uh, far field patterns, like a unit radiation patterns. And the same way when port two is excited, port one terminated. And say from, from this, this relation, indeed there, there exists uh, coefficients W1 and W2, where the, let's say the, the, the voltage that we calculate using circuit simulation techniques is, is say that the weight one times the the, the, the unit excitation uh, plus the, the weight W2 times the unit excitation at, at the, the um, port one when the radiation pattern two was measured. So it's slightly, so maybe it, it takes a, a while to, to, to go through this, but say the point is that the total radiated pattern can be calculated as a weighted sum of the unit radiation patterns. So the, the total radiation pattern is available, but of course it requires that we process, we, we must have this data. So we, we are not in the, in the traditional circuit simulation anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, this, this brings say the additional, very like a essential ingredient into the uh, technique that we do. If we only have circuit simulation, there is no way you can uh, do this. But um, with with when we have the radiation patterns available, the beauty is that it can be from EM simulation or from the chamber measurement. We can calculate, say, this this matrix relation very easily, and then we just do superposition of the the unit uh, like a reference uh, far fields. Uh, Yato, we, we have another question out. We need yes. to, um, Hassan, I, I hope it's okay. We're going to move. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chang. Hi, uh, this is Arka Jyoti. Um, hi, Yako. I had a hi. question. Um, so um, this bandwidth potential, is it uh, entirely based on something like uh, a double tuned passive matching or, uh, or is it also uh, like including uh, like some kind of active matching or non uh, It is quite simple. So it's, it's um, passive matching and ideal reactances. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's like a conceptual um like a template so we, at this stage we don't really uh consider for example the um the losses the, the losses are, are another thing so but as as a like a quick like um overview say assuming that okay so th this analysis is not making assumptions how good components you have mm -hmm. it's it's really ideal passive Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, we had another question from um, Mr. Hammond. Hey, yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, my question is for bandwidth potential. After applying uh, the analysis, for example, when you have conjugate bandwidth and after optimize it at 3.6 gigahertz, you said that it is like impossible to make the antenna uh, optimize at this point. Uh, do we have a limit for uh, 
the bandwidth to say, okay, if bandwidth potential is less than 50 megahertz, then we have to stop uh, or 200 megahertz, something like that? Um, <clears throat> yes, there are limits and, and the, the, the limit depends upon the, so let's, let's put it this way. Um, uh, there are like uh, academic studies on, on this limit. Say, let's say we, we reach with two components, 50 megahertz. So the question, can we get 100? Can we get 200? Uh, so the, the, like a the theoretical analysis is based on like, um, if we make certain like a model, let's say simplified model of the, the resonance, essentially if we, if we model at this frequency, the antenna as, as a, let's say parallel or serious resonator, then it depends upon the Q value of the, the antenna and also the, the target return loss level. So there is a different, so if, if, if we, if we uh, are aiming at very high, uh, very good return loss, for example, minus 20 dB, then it's a different factor. Maybe it's 1.5 or something like this. But if it's more loose, if we in the first place are looking at say 6 dB matching, then the factor is different. But the fact is that, so the, 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 the result anyway is that, that it's, it's a very finite number. So if I, with two components, I get 50 megahertz, with four components, I might get 70 or 80 megahertz. It saturates really quickly. And so when, when you just try it, then, then you, you see it uh, quite neatly that the, 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 sometimes there is misconception that by adding just more components, you can get it wider, but that's not true. So there is, so if, if you like uh, connect, say even infinite number of, of like a matching, like a resonator circuits, then you only get say uh, X times more bandwidth. And this X is, is something like about two in practice. So there is, a, there is a, a theoretical upper limit. Okay, if, if you allow me to uh, put my second question, uh, do, do we always need to uh, do EM simulation after the CX simulation from Optini? Uh, no, it's rather the, the other way around. So um, you, you can start your work. It's very often it's, it's with, with an EM simulation, but you can rely also on, on let's say measurements. So, because op ten is agnostic on the on the data, and of course, if you want to, to do it like a like as as discussed in this presentation, then you, if you do measurement based, you have to measure the radiation fields, the far fields also. Mm -hmm. But Thanks but typically so you do it once, and and then then you have everything that is necessary. It's already processed, and so the op ten work is post processing. Correct. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let's look at where or, or where the other other questions. So yeah, there's this... one more question. Okay, from, okay, uh, please. Yeah, Mr. yeah, Mr. I'm okay. Daniel, uh, I'm trying yeah. to. Oh, sorry, I, we we keep getting out of sync. Okay, go can ahead. you hear me now? Yes, I think you can okay, hear me now. So, yes. so this is this is very interesting. My concerns are, though, it seems quite sensitive. These analysis to small values of uh, inductance and capacitance. What about when the uh, an end user is holding this device, or maybe they're holding a portrait, maybe a landscape, maybe it's not being held at all. It could be on a desk. Um, it seems that the practicality of the small antenna would be severely impacted um, for, by random interactions with the user. Is that, a, is that something to be concerned about? Yes. So of course you, you could like, um, um, actually what, what we support is that <clears throat> you, you can have what we call impedance configuration. And so you can have, for example, three impedance configurations. So you may, may have like one configuration consists of this data, say these radiation patterns and, and this impedance to start with in free space. 
The second configuration could be that this uh, antenna is characterized with a phantom hand or an EM simulation of a phantom hand. So the impedance and the radiation patterns would be different. And third configuration could be, let's say, you have this uh, handset model next to the phantom head or a simulated phantom head. So we, we can indeed take several configurations simultaneously and then seek compromising solution. And so this would then uh, say take into consideration of of what what you were uh, worried about. So it's of course it's it's getting even worse when you put say or reduce further the uh, say the radiation efficiency by putting lossy objects near nearby, but that's the reality. And and indeed and or it can be like a, also consider that you had like a weight factors, so we 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 don't let say the 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 head position, which is maybe the most lossiest one. Uh, to dominate the whole problem, we want to have say um, good performance also while it's uh, on in in free space or on table or something that is far away from lossy objects, or it can be like a switched uh, case as well. That if the device recognizes that it's it's held in hand, then we can inform the switch that okay now it's a different configuration. And different values should be used for the for the aperture. Very good. Okay, I, I'm not sure how many slides you have left, Jaco. But uh... I have. Um, uh, 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 let's say I'm I'm elaborating say one one example on on how how it would work in practice. So maybe if I there is like a the, the like a main sort of main content is is already here. So maybe we can look through because there, there might be say things that that say the questions get clarified with the rest of the slides okay and so maybe then we can move to the end and then consider the the, the other questions yeah i think uh i don't see any new raised hands so okay uh, cool thank you go, go on yeah okay great okay so let's look an example case and um, uh, so we have we were looking at the assessment maps, so we, we know roughly what to expect and what to avoid. Avoid capacitors, for example. So it remains to formulate. So we need to select the subbands. Uh, we have to be able to model the switch using a let's say fully full full model with all the losses. So it can contribute a lot. Uh, and then we, we have to simultaneously obey the return loss, the component losses, and the radiation efficiency. And uh, then the, the optimization task or the synthesis, the synthesis is the thing that we do at Opteni, like as our daily bread, to find, a, let's say, a fixed matching circuit at the input port that is like a compatible with all the subbands. That's a bit tricky. And, but anyway, Opten is, is specialized in this kind of problem in the first place. So in this example, we, we slice the subbands as follows. So we, we go from 700 megahertz to 960. So taking like a, a practical uh, total range. And uh, we, uh, in the end, so we do our magic to, to formulate the problem as was uh, described. So we have a, a switch model here, um, which operates in the tuning port. Then we have, uh, say, as a result of the optimization and synthesis, we get the list of different topologies in the input and, and also the, the Apache component values vary, as you can see. Um, and so basically all of all of this is is like a, we are, we are using library components in this case say some famous libraries from from Murata and uh, Coilcraft as example so to account for 
all loss contributions to be as realistic as possible. And so we, we find, say, a compromise in terms of, say, performance, also the, the cost, because we have lots of topologies to choose from, so we can favor uh, like a less expensive um, circuit topologies. And indeed, we reach a quite a nice about 6 dB matching and a total efficiency ranging from minus 7 to minus 4 dB. And, and the circuit is shown here on the left. And it's very instructive to look at the power balance and to, to split the losses into subcomponents. So, for example, if we reach minus 7 dB for the lowest band, where does this uh, efficiency actually come from? So we have, first of all, we have the return loss component. <clears throat> so it's matched to, at a certain frequency, 740 megahertz, uh, minus 8 dB, it's okay. Then we have the, the component losses at the feed port. So we had this uh, T topology three components. They contribute only 3.4% losses. While the component losses of other ports is 30%. The radiation efficiency is, is only 42%. And so it's, it's, it's like an inevitable part or say it's already optimized say by the, the aperture component. And what is left is, is about 20% radiated power minus 6.7 dB uh, efficiency. But this encircled component loss is mostly switch loss in my examples. I'm using a realistic, maybe not the, not the latest and greatest switch model, but anyway, a realistic semiconductor switch. And um, because there are quite some currents going through, then the, say the, the switch loss itself peaks. So in the problem there are, based on this analysis, it's, it's sort of, in quote, in quote, low hanging fruits. So we can identify, or if we look closer where the losses are coming from, we can identify very clearly that the switch is guilty. And so there is a simple receipt how to improve use a better speech and more expensive, easy to say. So doing this exercise and, and using, say, instead of semiconductor switch, we use a MEMS-based switch, also a realistic real model. Uh, we can see that indeed, with otherwise similar setup uh, about the same component values, otherwise uh, we, we get one dB uh, improvement for every sub band but there is literally uh, say a price to be paid. The component losses have re reduced dramatically due to the uh, MEMS uh, switch having less losses. So it is sort of economical question and whether we can afford for some applications, maybe we can, some others we can't. Um, there is still one very good question, whether, say, our choice of the aperture port location is, is optimal in the first place. Maybe it's not. Say, sometimes it is, um, uh, as, as the antenna engineers, sometimes they tell that there is very little to do for that, so that the layout of everything else is determining uh, quite strictly the location of the port, but sometimes this, this port location is actually the degree of freedom in the design. And uh, specifically, if we use uh, CST as our EM simulation engine, then we can uh, define a closed optimization loop. So let CST and Opteni talk together, where this aperture port location is uh, swept over a certain range and then the EM tool is, is like a, uh, feeding the S parameters and radiation patterns at every step 
to obtain it. Obtain is doing its magic and getting the, the, the result. It takes time, obviously. So the EM simulation usually takes some time. But the, the good news is that the user is hands off. So people are, are running this over weekend. And indeed, in this specific example, so we uh, find out that by a more appropriate selection of the, the aperture port location, we can gain another 4.3 decibels by putting this port over here. And so the closer the feed, maybe it's, it's not so super surprising uh, uh, result, but said that the closer the feed, essentially the, the shorter the, the, the sorted antenna is. And so the uh, obtainable, say we have squeezed the, the performance into a single number, the cost function, which is essentially the minimum uh, efficiency. And uh, little wonder that having like a longer antenna is favorable for the low bands. But here, here we can see it and it's not always so clear cut. So sometimes the, the, the shape can be rather complicated. And, and so th this, this helps a lot. So once it's properly set up, you can let like an EM simulator and Optane lab say communicate together and you do some other things. And then after a while, you can come back and, and, and check what, what has been found. We are close to conclusions, in fact. So this is really a, a popular practical option to tackle this, these uh, mentioned three hurdles. Um, and indeed, in aperture tuning, we have say the both band available bandwidth and radiation efficiency are both influenced. And they, as we have seen in this, this case, they are often in conflict. Like open circuit would be good for good bandwidth, but unfortunately, it's not the best uh, efficiency. So we seek a compromise. And if we do say the loss breakdown properly, then we can at least say grab low hanging fruits. It might also be that some of the aperture component is just lossy inductor, for example, and then we may consider choosing a, an other type of, of inductor. And, and the switch indeed. And so technically it's also possible to couple the, the EM geometry optimization with, with the tuner design. And, and this way moving like a one hierarchy level up and, and then be assured that, that our choice of the, the position or the location of the aperture component is uh, the best. Um, so this is, this is more or less the end. And so we can now uh, spend a while still with if there are further questions. Um, this is Tom McKay. I I wanted to ask, I, I wanted to sort of um, ask about or point out uh, something that I think is less commonly understood. Um, when you were saying that um, you could tie the far field. Uh, well, and you said radiation pattern, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, and, and apply superposition, essentially. Yes. Um, that, that's kind of surprising, you know, because it, uh, it seems like the radiative element, when you put components like such as uh, on the aperture port, you, you, you might influence the, the current distribution in such a way to um, have it, the current wanna go in a place that's bad, that's lossy or something like this. And that, that, that doesn't seem like it would be captured, um, you know, in, in, uh, in a, 
in a superposition sort of mindset or whatever, but you were careful to say radiation pattern. Um, and so it sounds to me like um, there's sort of a reciprocity um, and and features, uh, you know, of of the of an antenna system defined as you're defining it with one feed port or one aperture port that you're going to, in both places, you're going to do something lumped element. Um, and 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 you know, my 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 struggle or the common maybe it's you know a common misconception that you need to redo the EM simulation because weird things can happen with the current distribution, but I just, I just want to... Mm, yeah, that, 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 that's not so uncommon concern. And say there is this one slide, so if you want, you can say, go carefully through what I'm saying there. I know it's, it's maybe too, too long to elaborate here, but the, say the thing, uh, how I view is that, um, um, because it's a linear process, so how the, how the fields say so if what I call yeah. unit unit field. So I have excitation at port one and I'm terminating port two. Um, that's a one, let's say, which corresponds to certain current distribution. And this current distribution is then responsible for this far field. Yeah. And then then we have the other, say the the other other say you need excitation when we move the excitation to the aperture yeah. port and then we terminate the feed port instead and then it corresponds to an other current distribution which is then responsible for the file field and when the, the why we can then like a uh, calculate sort of the current distribution of the say the combined system without re resorting back to the EM tool, we we are not actually calculating say the 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 current distributions again, but we are relying for the fact that once we know the weight factors for the unit excitations, then the far field superpose. And and, and, uh, and, it, and it's reasonable in my mind to to imagine. On a, on a linear system such as you've described, which is an antenna, but you, you're making it into a two port. Uh, well, actually a three port, I guess. You have the, mm -hmm. the two physical like uh, connection, conduction ports, and then you have a radiation port, if maybe. And, uh, but the point is, is that when you say it that way, okay, as long as I don't um, box myself into but what I'm kind of worried about is, but I, I get it. It's you know I, I can see superposition on the current distribution when you once you have two, the two um, sort of degrees of freedom uh, sampled. I mm -hmm. can see that you know you could then uh, do combinations that would that would uh, reflect the, the the current distribution and their uh, uh, well the radiation pattern and, and it must have something to do with the current distribution. And so that, that seems um, amenable or, you know, can be effective with superposition there. I guess yes. I would say, um, and, that, and that's really cool. I, I guess I would say I'm a little concerned um, having kind of put that in my head as, as, the, as, as you've shown and asserted um, that you could potentially um, get into trouble with, um, problems where you know they're ill-conditioned or something because you really haven't fleshed out um the space very well because you're not uh you know you're not by definition doing orthogonal um sort of basis functions of the current distribution you know or something and and they you know and you know i, I just can you comment to that that you know like how do you know that you're not running into an ill-conditioned problem. Um, yeah, let me scroll back to the to the motivation here. So the ill-conditioning would follow if this matrix here would be singular. And so if 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 they were 
like um, linearly dependent upon each other. Um, and of course, we could. I, I think okay. we. So, so yeah, you so, can tell. You can tell here because you can see if it's ill-conditioned or not. Because, yes. Yes. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Thank you and, for and, that. I. I, I mean, yeah. I, I follow. And then, um, yeah, the cool thing is that you're kind of using this principle uh, described here: radiation mm -hmm. patterns superposed linearly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, that's a yeah. fundamental of physics. I think you're you're, you're telling us. Yeah. That yeah. It is surprising for many. Um, I think uh, that you can do this effectively, but it's very cool, and uh, I I get it. And um, anyway, uh, that was kind yeah. of my question. I. I yeah, yeah, I see it. Uh, yeah, I, it, 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 it's, it's like a, uh, it, it's really, yeah, I, I think it's, it's somehow counterintuitive uh, in a way, in, in the way that you describe and say, the thing is that we, we, we really, the thing that we don't calculate, we don't calculate the near fields. We don't calculate the, we, we have no information on the, say the currents on the device itself because we have information only on the far fields, but that's what, what we need. So, so there is still, still said in, in practice. So if you are worried about say potential, say near field or say the, the hot spots uh, in the current distribution or something, if there are such issues, then, then you, when, once you have the design, then you can go back to the EM tool and then calculate say that and look at the surface currents, for example. But they, these are indeed not necessary for the efficiency calculation because yeah, the, and, that, and that's the cool uh, observation. Yeah. Um, yes. well, well, I guess a related question is: um, uh, Have you validated, um, you know, this procedure with um, antenna measurements over um, a solution space that you developed? Um, our methods of so uh, we have validated this with say with standalone EM tools say mm -hmm. many times and in in fact because this generalizes also for example to problems like antenna arrays very very same principle and and because we have been working with antenna arrays as well and so we we, we can use the same way if we have say eight element array we calculate this what I call unit far fields and then we can terminate the, the array ports with either discrete components or have different excitations. And this gives us the possibility to optimize the beam also by the same token. I see. And, and so we have validated this, uh, say, numerous times. And because there, there is no hand waving, it's, it's, it's like basically this equation, what we see here. And so you could construct, say, linearly dependent cases like ideal short circuit between the yeah. between the ports, things like that. Then this matrix will will get ill conditioned. But say otherwise, and unless you are seeking such problems, then then the physics kind of guarantees that it can't be ill conditioned. So there are like a two independent degrees of freedom. I I, I follow. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Yako. Are, are there any other questions? I don't see any new hands raised. Okay. Right. Um, uh, I, I'll just click here, though. Wait. Uh, anyway, uh, there's a, a hand raised, but I think it's left over from. Uh, okay. From before, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully. If I'm wrong, the person will re-raise their hand. So, um, Tan, are you uh, going to close us out here? Uh, Tan, too, are you there? Well, I, I want to say um, thank you, uh, Yako. This is a very interesting presentation. Thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm. Uh, you got uh, a lot of. Uh, questions uh, showing a, a kind of, um, you know, uh, curiousness about this, this concept, yes. you know, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and I think it, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's really cool that you've done this and, um, and shared um, yeah. this physics with us, as well as, 
you know, um, you know, sort of the, the software tool that if one was in the business of this, they could yeah. contact you. So yeah, so my pleasure. Yeah. Indeed, that was that was a pleasure to to have have this presentation and all these discussions. Okay. So. Well, um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think uh, uh, look look to our um, short course um, uh, announce uh, invitation coming out. There'll be a, a, an Eventbrite uh, hosting for that. Um, we're really excited about that. It's a Saturday morning, uh, well, Saturday, pretty much morning and afternoon. Um, but it, it, uh, it, we have a tradition in the Santa Clara Valley uh, MTT Society to hold these short courses. Uh, we've been doing it for decades. It's become a little thin lately uh, in, in some years, but we did hold one two years ago in person. Unfortunately, we need to do this one um, virtual but then it opens up the possibility to get participants from uh, uh, from Texas and uh, Michigan and um, and actually the East Coast. So we're really uh, thrilled to, to bring that to you. And then please um, consider throwing in to uh, participate in the in the chapter and then in the society um, um, officer nominations uh, process is going on. You can nominate yourself. Just send the information to jsbanwade at ieee.org, and um, and we'll be uh, he'll be announcing the election um, soon. So with that, I think we'll end the meeting. Thanks, everyone.